When Tess Scott's third husband left her, she spent weeks with her face buried in the green shag carpet, begging God to make him stay, but he didn't. Three years after their divorce, guess what happened? They remarried. And three weeks later, she was diagnosed with breast cancer. Tess knows pain and she also knows victory. Tess knows how to parent during times of extreme stress, including parenting an adopted son with FAS, two sons who struggled with substance abuse, one of them who attempted suicide, and the list goes on. Today, Tess is going to share her story and her book entitled, Listen, Sister, Finding Hope in the freak show of life. Have you ever felt like giving up, quitting, throwing in the towel? Welcome to Never Ever Give Up Hope featuring Carol Graham. She's an author, health coach, and motivational speaker. Backed into a corner multiple times in her life, Carol shares with you stories on how she overcame some of the toughest obstacles a person can go through in life, but refused to give up hope. Rather than admit defeat, an opportunity was presented, and it involves each and every one of you. Carol will feature spectacular guests who will share their messages of hope, encouragement, and their inspiration to prove why life's adversities only make you stronger. And now, welcoming the host of the show, here's Carol Graham. Scott is a speaker and an award-winning author and is on a mission to encourage others with messy stories. Oh my goodness, I love that statement. And they are not alone. Many are going to relate to Tess's story today. So welcome, Tess. Oh, thank you so much, Carol. Thank you. All right. So let's jump right in and you start your story from as early as you would like to start it. And I'll have questions as we go along. Okay. So I was born in Ontario. I'm from Canada. I was born um, on a farm, or I was raised on a farm, I guess, and in the middle of nowhere, you know, in the boonies, um, and I have three younger brothers, but I was an extrovert right from the beginning, raised in the middle of nowhere. And I always wanted to have people around me. My childhood, my parents um, were farmers. It was pretty, um, how, what's the word for it? Like, we didn't have a lot. Let's say that. Um, but we had lots of fun raised out in the middle of nowhere. And I grew up, my grandparents took me to church. And um, I grew up with a family who loved me, but not everything was perfect. I can tell you that. And I also grew up as a little girl already with shame. Aww. Yeah. And, and thinking back, you know, I didn't realize that at the time. Right. But thinking back, I knew there was something different between me and other girls. Even before I got to high school, even in elementary school, I thought that there was something really different about me because things that have that had happened to me when I was a little girl that made me different. And I grew up believing that, you know, and it took a long time before I realized you know, before I was able to maybe work through that, like tons of counseling, sister, I can tell you that, um, <laughs> to, work, to work through those things and figure out that about myself. And that's the way I saw myself. And I'm learning that maybe that's why I made the decisions that I made going through, you know, through life and not blaming that. But there's still reasons that we see see ourselves in certain ways. And I've been married. I say I'm a black sheep turned Jesus girl. So <laughs> I've been I've been married four times. And oh I'm word. not even a movie star, right? Like I'm I'm not one of those movie stars that have all these marriages right, and right, things right. like that. But I've been married four times and twice to the same guy. So spoiler there. I thought that I had everything kind of put together by the third time. 
lots of mistakes, lots of terrible choices, but I'm finally on the right track. Okay. Uh. I'm finally on the right track, married to Rick, love him to pieces. We have these seven kids, including an adoptive son with um, FAS. I always have to say adopted son because I don't want anyone to think that I drank when I was pregnant because, you know, um, I'm not a perfect mom, but I didn't do that. And uh, we have seven kids. I get pregnant. So number eight boy, eight boys. It was a freak show. Yeah. Yeah. Just like the milk alone. We had five teenagers at one time, five teenage (laughs) boys. Imagine, Carol, the amount of milk we went through in our house a lot. And um, anyway, so so it was it was a freak show, but everything seemed like I thought everything was going well. I'm I'm doing what I think I'm supposed to be doing. I'm going to church. I'm like we're raising these boys and everything. And things are really busy. I have to tell you that there's shoes everywhere. It didn't matter that there was a cubby for shoes. They never ended up there. There's rules. It didn't matter. Um, Anyways, uh, I said to my husband one day, we were getting groceries or something. That was called date night, getting groceries. And I said, man, lately, you know, I just feel like you don't really love me or something because, Mm -hmm. you know, whatever these reasons, Mm -hmm. you know, you never, you know, we don't hold hands. I don't know. I don't remember exactly what it was. I remember where I was standing, though. And he I said, and he's and I said, for the last couple of weeks, and he said, couple weeks it's been a lot longer than that and I thought oh wow what What? and yeah and then that like I can still see where I was standing and and it was a longer conversation and he said yeah I don't I don't love you anymore I don't know and um so then there was months of trying to work this out go to counseling talking about things and and he ended up leaving and I can tell you that I hit the ground my face was buried in the green carpet of my bedroom. Hmm. Literally, this is not an exaggeration, buried in that carpet day after day after day. And just begging God, like, I do not want to be divorced three times. This is not like, like, how do you even tell somebody that? Uh-uh, uh-huh. There's so much shame. And, um, and yet he did, he, he left. And, and after a few months, and at that time, Um, I think we had three kids still home. Most of them were older. And I said, um, I wanted to meet him for coffee or something. He never argued. Like, we never fought, like, like, um, arguing. Voices would never be raised. He's more passive aggressive. So he just wouldn't answer my text kind of thing. And so I said, let's just, let's just meet for coffee at Tim Hortons. Because that's what you do if you're in Canada. You go to Tim Hortons. And so we went to Tim Hortons. And that's a coffee shop. And, um, and talk. And I said, I really, this is like, maybe a year after we were separated, he lived somewhere else. And I said, can we just like try to make this work? I still love you. You know, every day I pray that you'll, you'll change your mind. And this is what he said. Nah, I'm good. Nah, I'm Are you good. kidding me? No. <laughs> I couldn't make that up. Nah, I'm good. I'm like, wow, wow. And I was in my early fifties, so not dead yet. And I didn't want to be alone and I wasn't going to date or anything. If, um, you know, if, if our marriage can be reconciled, but clearly it can't because he's good. So, um, yeah, we got divorced. And so there I am three times divorced. So yeah, it was just not what I expected or wanted to see come from my life. But every single day I prayed that he would change his mind, that God would change his mind, that we could get be together because I still loved him. I still loved him. I wasn't happy with the things I learned Uh and, uh you know, why he left and all of that. I'm, you know, not a fan of that, but I just, I didn't give up. I did other things. Okay. I dated a couple people. I, you know, I moved on in life. I got a great job and life went on. I didn't stay with my head in the green carpet for those three years. Um, but yeah, it was, it was hard. It was, and it was hard watching my kids. Sometimes I think it's harder watching other people process through things and be hurt yes, than yes. absorbing it myself. Do you think so? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess three years after we were divorced, um, some things happened. He was, he came by to pick up our youngest son for a basketball game and, um, in Detroit. And, uh, he's, and he said, 
do you want to go? I'm like, what? Hmm. What do I want to go? Like, I mean, talk to me. So I went because, yeah, first of all, I want to watch basketball. Like, who doesn't want to watch the Detroit Pistons play? And uh, so I went and he talked to me on the way there, which was just, this is just surreal, right? Because he, like I yeah. said, he was uh-huh. more of an avoider. And um, then, you know, he talked to me a few times off and on about mostly about our son. And, and this is different. And then um, he asked me out for dinner. And we went out for dinner and it was on May the 4th and, you know, may the 4th be with you. And he said, uh, every single day, I regret decisions that I made in my life. Wow. And I just want to be in your life. I just want, you know, to have a, a relationship to date, to just be together, to hang out, to play games, to, mm-hmm. you know, and, and he went through, you know, and he said, every day I see people that I hurt because oh, you don't goodness. just hurt the person that you yes, left. Yes. Yeah. So whether it's in-laws or whoever people, mutual friends, like every day, like he just couldn't get away from it. And, um, and I said, what's your intention? You know, what, <laughs> And he said, I want to get married. I want to be married to you. And so we dated for, I said, yes. So we dated for <laughs> nine months and no, what May till September, four months seemed longer. And every day we talked through things because we had to talk through a lot of junk that happened. It wasn't right, like, oh, let's just forget any of that happened. Yeah, yeah. Right. And he said, I will always tell you the truth. You can ask me anything. And I didn't really want to know, but I had to know, you know, so I would ask, yes. like, okay, on this day, remember on this day when you said you were doing this, is that really where you went and stuff like that? And I had to hear really hard things, but it would, I had to, I mean, we had right. to That's work right. through it. We couldn't just ignore it. And not everything was his fault. Some things are my fault. I, I recognize that and own that and, and went to counseling and we worked through it. And then we got married on September the 9th. And just in a, in the pastor's office, just with one of our sons and our friends, couple best friends, you know, like just five of us. Because I have to say that like your fourth wedding is considerably smaller than your first wedding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're not throwing flowers. There's not like, yeah, it was real small. And then and surprised everybody. And it was like, it was a great day. Did, and Did people and, know you were dating? Yes. People knew we were dating. So it was it was pretty shocking for everybody. And so I had I can tell you this little story. I was um, I had gone out to this new restaurant. This is just before that. So in April and it was a new shawarma restaurant. I think that's how you say it around the corner. And we all people from work all went together, ate and every single one of us felt ill later. And it was and too bad because it was oh. really yummy food at the time. <laughs> So, so fast forward a few weeks and I say to my, one of my sons, um, who is living here, one of the older sons, I said, you know, my, you know, uh, Rick, Ricky, um, asked me out on a date and I said, I'm so excited. And my son said, you know, mom, I think he's like the shawarma. Like you remember how good it was at the time, but you forget the pain that happened later. Wow. And I thought, wow, because it's not just me, right? I, I have to think about of course. everybody else who was hurt in this and their recovery from it and their journey through it. So I can't just jump into this and say, oh, well, because, it, you know, there's the risk that my kids could get hurt again. So I had to think about that, too. Um but I said to, so my, my brother said, like, are you sure you want to do this? When I said, I'm, I'm dating him. And um, I said, I asked God every day for three years to do this, to pull off this miracle. Mm-hmm. Now he's doing it. How could I walk away from this? Good point. How could I? This is what I asked for. It's the most amazing thing in my life, Carol, and I will never get over it. I will never get over this miracle. I will never okay. just say, oh, well, it's just, it's nothing. Like, it blows my mind that this could happen, that we could get remarried, that God brought us back together after divorce. And how long ago was that? 
Um, we got married the second time in 2016. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that part of your story. And I know, as I said on the top of the show, that there are going to be many people who relate to the different aspects that you have already shared, let alone some of the things that you that you went through that I also shared at the top of the show, mm-hmm. like the breast cancer and the stress of, of raising these children under these circumstances. Do you want to share just a couple minutes about that, please? Our wedding was our little affair wedding was September the 9th. Um, And then on September 30th, I went for just a a routine mammo and found out I had breast cancer. And I was really mad. (laughs) I mean, are you kidding? This is my honeymoon year, right? This is my year that is going to be Mm. um, finally able to, you know, have a physical relationship with my husband. And also like all the fun stuff. This is going to be all the fun stuff. (laughs) And right, I have someone to do life with I'm over the moon excited about it. And instead, it was a mastectomy and chemotherapy and radiation. And, you know, um, drives to the hospital and all that for a year. And it yeah, I was I was not happy about it. Let's just say I lost my hair. I don't look good bald. Um, some women <laughs> look great bald. I know. I'm not them. I am not them at all. There's not enough makeup. It just doesn't work for me. I, as much as I was mad and angry, and that's okay that it that it happened. I now know that that is the best was the best timing for us. Because that allowed my husband to take care of me because I had right. to. Right. Good point. I had yes. to let him. Yes. But even though we we were married and in love and all that and all that, she says, um, I still, you know, I was still holding back. I mean, I still was, you know, I can take care of myself because I'm Miss Independent now. I've been independent for the last three years. I had to give that up. I, I was sick on my mm. couch. You know, he's bringing me tea. He took time off work. He's driving me to appointments. He's sitting with me in chemo. You know, he helped me shave my head when my hair is coming out in big gobs. Um, He did all those things. And that also allowed my kids to say, wow, dad's here. You know, he's right. They saw that. Of course. They saw that. Yeah. Right. So really, I can be thankful for that timing now. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, I'm going to we're going to talk about that timing and what's changed in your life as a result of that understanding. And also, we're going to talk about your book and we'll be right back. Carol Graham would like to show you the path from misery to miraculous triumph in her fast paced memoir, Battered Hope. She relates her determination to succeed as someone who experienced one horrendous nightmare after another. Gang raped and left for dead, loss of a child, husband falsely imprisoned, and cancer. Nothing could break her tenacity or faith. No matter what you face, heartache, loss, suffering, or injustice, Carol will illustrate how she became a victor the same way you can. The secret is to never ever give up hope. Order your copy at Amazon or batteredhope.blogspot.com. As I mentioned, I've really enjoyed listening to your story and I'm relating in many ways, including that we have an adopted an FAS child. And he was seven years old before we found that out. We adopted him as a baby. So there are many parts of your story that I'm relating to and also our our other listeners we have an estranged son for the last 11 years Mm -hmm. so there are many parts of the pain that people are going through that they need to hear coming from somebody like you who have been there and how you coped with that so could you share a little bit about that please yeah we I think that many of us are struggling with our kids and I think that one of the big things that I struggled with was feeling like when my kids are struggling, it's my fault. Of course. When my kids are battling addiction, it's maybe it's because I wasn't a good mom, or maybe it's because I wasn't there for them or all of those things, right? And that's all lies. 
it's all lies. And two of our, our oldest son is, I mean, he's 38 now, which is weird because I'm barely 38 myself. Um, so he's, he's doing great. He's grown up. He, he actually lives on the family farm that where my, where I grew up, my grandchildren are in my bedroom, which they can't believe because I was never young, you know? Um, so he's, you know, he's doing great. But a couple of our other kids struggled with addiction in in high school years. And those were hard times, not at the same time, thankfully. I'm very thankful for that. But it just it wrecks your whole family for a little while. Right. It just wreaks havoc because you don't know day by day by day. You're just getting through that day, that day, that day. But they're doing well now. Oh, you know, that's awesome to hear. They're, they're both doing well. One of them came back from rehab and right away his girlfriend got pregnant and he became a dad at 18. And I have to tell you that I was not super impressed at that. I don't know if you're going to listen to this, but probably not. Um, because I was worried. Oh, yes, my yes. Oh, my goodness. I mean, I can barely pull off being a mom in my 30s and you're going to be a dad at 18 and and he's such a great dad and he has three kids and and everything is great he helps with the youth group in his church and he's I mean you know everybody has struggles in life but he's doing great both our boys that struggled with that are doing great now and you know what there's hope there is yes, hope. I yes. want to tell you that if your kids are struggling right now that there is hope that's just I mean, that's I, I love talking to women about this, about I like, you know, women and men, but I mostly speak to women that there is hope in the freak that's show right. of life. And at that's the moment, right. it does not feel like it. I'm going to tell you that right. like people would say that to me right. and I would be like, you don't understand. Yeah. You with your perfect little life over there. Right, wearing exactly. the collar, Like you don't know. But but it's true. There is there is eventually hope. And I knew that. I was supposed to, there came a point in my life when I knew that I was supposed to share my story. You know, I felt really strong uh -huh, about wanting uh -huh. to. And so I did not want to, I have to tell you, because who wants to stand up and uh -huh. say, yes, I've been divorced for, I've been divorced four times. I've had an affair. My kids have been on drugs. I've been like, nobody wants to sign up for that. Right. I was working at a community college at a fire school where we train municipal and um, industrial fire because I live in Sarnia, Ontario. So it's a chemical valley where we have all these refineries and we have to train these workers of what to do if there is a fire in the refinery. It's a pretty big deal. Um, so I'm working there and I'm kind of like, remember radar on MASH? Uh -huh, uh -huh. I'm like the nucleus of this. Everything, everything is happening around me. So I'm an admin person, but I'm, I'm helping everybody. I'm just in the middle of it. And I think I'm pretty much it, right? Like this place will crash if not for Tess Scott. That's what I think. And um, it's not true, but I thought that. So <laughs> I'm at work and, um, and I think everything can't run without me. So I'm getting ready for work in the morning. I'm at home. And I'm putting my makeup in the bathroom, putting my makeup on because, you know, this doesn't just happen. And I noticed that my smile is kind of crooked. And I thought, oh, that's weirder than normal. But I have to keep putting on makeup and go to work because, like I said, Carol, the whole place will crash. Uh -huh. Yes, yes, that's right. So I went to work and uh, finally my boss came in and he said, Tess, what's wrong with your face? Oh, Which, wow. No woman wants to hear. So <laughs> I went to uh, Emerge, as we call it in Canada, Emerge. And um, they thought I was having a stroke. So they started running tests, you know, and they call my husband in. I did not want them to because he is a shift worker and we do not need to bother him. Uh -huh. There's nothing wrong. There is nothing going on here. And uh, by the time he arrived in, at the hospital, my eyesight was blurry. I couldn't see well. Um, and my speech was really, really blurred and my mouth was all, you know, uh -huh, right. my speech was blurred and I couldn't, I couldn't speak to him. I couldn't say the words I needed to say. And I was so upset. They thought I was having a stroke. And I remember because my mind was not blurred, even though sometimes it is, but, um, and I, and I thought like, really? I thought God wanted me to share my story and now I can't see and I can't speak. And how am I supposed to do this? And I remember thinking that and they kept me in for three days, which is a long time uh -huh. running all these tests. And they found out that it was a, simply a TIA, right? So a, a transient ischemic attack. Huh. And 
yeah, like a little mini stroke. And I went home and I can still see my husband standing in the kitchen with his arms crossed. And I said, I'm so thankful it was nothing. It was just like this little, little warning thing. I mean, it's really nothing. Just a false alarm. And he said, was it Tess? Was it? (laughs) You hear his voice and I say that. Was it Tess? Was it a false alarm? Or was it a real alarm that you know what you're supposed to be doing and you need to do it? Hmm. Yeah. So I did. I went back. I mean, thankfully I have him. So I went back into work um, the next day and I retired. We're going to call it with air quotes. I quit my job um, a month later. I quit my job that day, was finished a month later and started writing and wrote a book. And I had a book contract in two months and started speaking and traveling everywhere and speaking to women and encouraging them and haven't looked back and so thankful. So what, thankful. A, what a life change, right? It was a huge yeah. life change. Huge. Yeah. So you made a, a statement that I'd like to ask you about that goes right along with what you're saying. And it was a quote and you said, sometimes what seems to be the worst timing is actually the best. Expound mm-hmm. on that a little bit. Yeah. Well, I talked a little bit about that, like with the, right. with the breast cancer, right? right? Like I thought it was the worst timing because I had just got married. We had just got married again. I want the first year to be amazing, but instead it was going through all those things. But in the end I could see and look back and say, you know what, that was that was actually the best timing. And I really want to be able to see when things happen, like kind of see the, not the silver lining, but, but see how something good came out of that. How it was orchestrated. Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah, see how it was orchestrated. Because we don't always see it all, right? Right, right. But sometimes we can see why things happen. Sometimes we can, you know, look back and watch how the pieces were intricately w- woven together. But most of the time we can't. Thank you for sharing that because I, I know that as I'm relating, many others are as well. Now tell us about your book. I love the title. Ah, uh, Listen, Sister. Well, because I always say that. Oh, okay. (laughs) Finding hope in the freak show of life. Like I said, our our life was a freak show. My husband would always walk in the door and say, this is a freak show. (laughs) So it's it's like almost a hundred short, funny stories about God showing up in the ups and downs of life. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Everything from breast cancer to toilet training. Uh, to, you know, kids peeing in the Lego, um, to marriage reconciliation. I mean, all the short little stories, because sometimes the only time that you have to read is in the bathroom. Yes, right. um, People are just sitting there on their phones anyways, so they might as well read this. And it's encouraging. It's just how it's just how God showed up, the faithfulness through the ups and downs of life. It makes you laugh, might make you cry. You might relate to it and you might think this woman is crazy. I don't know. I think it's awesome. That sounds like a, yeah. yeah, And I love the fact that it's, is it like separate stories? It's not like uh, written as a novel. It's written just in separate story. Yeah. So like you said, it's almost like a devotional, but it's not. (laughs) Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's awesome. Exactly. And not in any particular order. Okay. Good. Good. All Mm -hmm. right. Well, this has been inspiring to say the least, and motivating, I'm sure, for many in the audience. So to sum it up, is there anything that you would like to either add or chat about or it be an encouragement to someone? I Well, I'd, I love to encourage women. I mean, that's my jam, right? That's my thing. And I love to help them to shed their shame. Because as I said, when we first started out, that's how I grew up in this, in this mindset of shame. And I felt like I could never do anything and look, right. And look how God changed everything. And someone like me can encourage other women. I mean, if that doesn't inspire you, I don't know what does. I love encouraging women and I would love to come and encourage your friends wherever you are, right? I've been traveling around doing that. And the awesome. very the very most important thing, the very, 
the most important thing that I want you to take away from this is I want you to fill your head with truth, right? Mm. Make sure that the things that you're thinking about are actually true and not the lies. Excellent. Excellent. What a great place to sum it up. I thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Tess Scott, for being on Never, Ever Give Up Hope. Thank you for listening to Never, Ever Give Up Hope, featuring Carol Graham. Did you know that most people succeed because they are determined to? Quitting was never an option. Carol loves your comments and will respond to each one. So please subscribe and review this podcast. A rating of five stars would be outstanding and appreciated. Remember, if you are still here, there is always hope.